five minutes, and uh, we, we ask you to move in our hearts, shape us, dig up some stuff in us, maybe even uh, uh, change the way we think about some lies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you pull Genesis 3, 8 up, please, onto the screen? When the cool evening breezes were blowing, how many know the cool evening breezes have been blowing and it's been nice? One, one fall fashion is like way better than summer fashion. You get to wear the scarves. We get to wear jeans and like sweatshirts. I just feel so good. I get to wear layers again. I'm stuck in like tank tops in the same pants. Gosh, don't get me started on shorts. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. I want to just kind of start back at the very, very beginning with this series. And as we kick off our fall here, I want to start way, way back at the beginning, kind of even before um, the Bible starts, um, with kind of my picture of where everything kind of stood as the Bible story begins. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I say Holy Ghost because it's like cooler. You could say Holy Spirit, but I like the Holy Ghost. Um, and uh, they all existed. They, were, they have like always all existed. They've always all been one God. It's important to understand. This is not like we didn't have three gods in council. We had one God who was eternally separate and completely separate and completely one. Can't explain it. Um, existing forever with the attributes God has always had. So perfect justice in this love uh, of one God, perfect uh, uh, compassion, perfect love, perfect everything that God is, has always been. He has been before people were around too. Um, and he is actively expressing this to himself uh, and in his way that he does this beyond space. Um, that we understand as space. So this is like the mind-blowing section of the, the bigness and the greatness of God. Um, I hope you can see it, that out of this perfect love and perfect devotion and this perfect uh, um, justice and compassion, this perfect, um, uh, 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 this, it overflows. And he decides to create humanity, people. He decides to create earth. He decides to create so he could share who he is with people and uh, have them then feel and experience what it's like to be like him, to understand, to have love like God. Um, uh, the, the, the purpose for humanity is probably a bigger topic than I can cover here this morning, but know that relationship with God is the number one most important thing that you, will, um, uh, that, that you were made to do. Made to have, made to be, is in relationship with God. Heart connected to him. Um, which is interesting, Jesus, when he's on the planet, um, he says, many people will come to me on the day that I return, and I begin to cast judgment. Jesus is the one who sits on the throne judging people's lives. So um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's not like a, a real smart thing to say, like, only God can judge me when someone's like trying to give you good constructive criticism because like God will judge you. <laughs> That's coming. And Jesus said that on that day as he's standing before people, and, he's, and, and he'll be like interacting, and he'll be saying, this is a thing. These are the things you did. This is who you are. But like, you've, there, he said there's going to be many people on that day who say, who he says, I don't know you. And they're going to be like, I, but I cast out demons in your names. I healed the sick. I, um, I, I preached your message. I tweeted about you. I, I shared the, 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 the God Vines videos. I listened to Caleb. I even read my Bible. He's going to say, but I didn't know you. And then he's going to say, be gone from me. Now, isn't that intense? But, that's, but it's really kind of cool that he like shows us that ahead of time. So we know now that on that day, what's the, what's the rubric? What's the standard? What's the, what's the thing that's going to like count when it comes to Jesus that he's going to reward? It's going to be like, I knew you. Because that's what this was all about. I remember 
you can remember maybe back to um, Sunday school when you're learning about Adam and you get this picture and it's, it's sort of funny to me when he was sitting there with God and um, God created all of this stuff and he said I want you to reign over it, rule over it, have dominion over it and then he gives Adam the job of like naming animals. I think this is hilarious. Um, uh, just kind of like the way it all happened in, in our minds. Because in my mind, we've got like this big long line of animals and Adam kind of sitting on a chair with like a, uh, um, with like a notepad and he's like, zebra. You just like imagine that. Just like, and then it just keeps going the whole time and um, God, God, had give, had God had given Adam not only this like relationship with him, but work involved in that as well. He gave him uh, like, like dignity in the fact that he wanted to partner with Adam all the time since the very beginning. He's wanted to partner with people in the middle of his own work. He's never wanted to do it alone. Because he understands there's something amazing and fulfilling about doing the work. Which is why in our lives, in our evangelism, in our, it, we, we, he like gives us work to do. As a result of the fall, the work changed. But he gives us work to do. So, if, so as, as Jesus has come back to reconcile and bring back humanity's originally intended purpose that we threw away, uh, when we get back to heaven, expect to have work to do. I think we were made to partner with God to work. That work looks very different um, now than it did in the garden. It looks very different now than it will into eternity. Some people tell you they know exactly what eternity holds for us. And I would say, mm, good guess, maybe. I think it's a long time <laughs> to be sure of after a very short life. Um, but uh, uh, we were made with God to be with God forever, and he gave us uh, some limitations and some rules, because why? Because love is only love when there's a choice. Remember, love is only love when there's a choice. If I was the last man on earth and Christina was the last woman on earth, I could claim to love her forever. And that would be very easy, considering there was no choice involved. I've always been faithful to her, right? Imagine this, we're on an island for our whole lives. I'd always been faithful to her. I'd never cheated on her once. I'd never chosen someone over Christina. You're like, that's easy. There was no choice in this. I'm like, yeah. And, and so that, like, that love then doesn't carry very much weight beyond then, you know, my word. But when there's, if there it was, say, like three and a half billion women on the planet, and I picked Christina, or she picked me, that says a lot that out of three and a half billion, I want one. And, and that's kind of how the, the garden was set up a bit. Like, like, like God said, everything you can have, but here's the thing, don't do this thing. It's bad for you. It's actually going to kill you. And they did that, that, that one thing. There was like one thing. You had one job. You have one thing. Don't do this one thing. Um, and in that way, they traded God's intended purpose for them. All of the stuff he'd given them to do, to rule and reign over the garden in the east of Eden. And to, uh, to walk with him, and to be in relationship with him, to know him. They traded everything for their own way. This, that thing they did we call sin, and it was death to them. God promised it would be death to them, and it proved to be death to them. And, and if, honestly, if we look at the, 
the way the Bible is, and we look at like even the way that our lives are, and we look at that thing, that little thing. It was like we had part of like an apple or some other forbidden fruit halfway, like one time they just ate it. They just ate it. And you're like, that's not that big a deal. But I think like as we start to let that kind of thought creep in, as we start to let that kind of thinking move into our hearts and our minds, and we start to think it like, look at this at like, oh my gosh, that's not that big of a deal. We start to then believe the same lie that Adam and Eve bought that day. What? The, the truth of God, he said, you will die. They said, mm, it's, it can't be that big of a deal. I wonder how often we buy that in our lives. Like, well, it can't be that big of a deal. Think about some of the kids downstairs. If we put a jar just right in the middle of their classroom that said, like, don't eat this cookie, and then we left, and they, like, ate the cookie, we're like, mm, that's not that big a deal. Like, we get that. They obviously wanted the cookie. But that's what Adam and Eve did. And I'm not saying, like, we need to be, like, testing our children with nanny cams and trying to, you know, like, whatever. The, I'm saying sin is a bigger deal than you think it is. Uh, um, trading in God's desire and rule and reign over our lives, his ability to speak the truth and us to obey it, when we, tra when we trade that in, for like, oh, you know what, I know better. That sin, that little sin, caused the fall of all creation, not just humanity, all creation, to the point where now creation is still groaning out for the, for the revealing of the sons of God. It means that, like, they're waiting for Jesus to come back so we can set this whole thing right again. One apple, one afternoon. Sin's a big deal to God. And it does, like, honestly, I don't care if it's a big deal to you. It's a big deal to God. We don't understand how much it matters to him. And I pray, God, would you show us how that matters to you? This is a big deal. And so now all of us, in our own ways, a million times, over our lives, have, have sinned, have rebelled against God, have put ourselves as God instead of letting God be God. You know, I know better. You don't have to look very hard, very long at the list of even just the Ten Commandments to figure out, yeah, no, I don't, I didn't measure up. I think it's Ray Comfort. Have you ever, you know, the, the whole thing, I don't know. If I ask you if you ever s stole something, I think he says a stealer, it would make you a stealer. I just totally butchered that. We're going to go back a couple <laughs> seconds, forget that I did that. Just forget that I did that. All right. So not long after this, um, God gave this thing called the law. So uh, actually it was kind of long after this comparatively, but biblically, not long into the Bible, um, God gave this thing to Moses called the law, Ten Commandments, just referenced it. Um, the purpose of this law is kind of twofold. Uh, first it is to show us where we're sinning. Show us where we don't meet the standard. Show us the problem. It's not like sin created, or the law created sin, right? Adam and Eve did that, <laughs> in a way. Uh, that like, it didn't, the law it isn't like all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, now all these, these things. Have. The law is there to reveal to us the places that we need, um, that we are falling short. And then it is there to show us the payment. Show us that all sin needs Payment. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, I'm in the very beginning of Leviticus. I'm not going to read it because um, we've got a we gotta, we gotta kickoff today. Um, um, uh, Leviticus 4, 5, 6, 8, 16 um, talks about the sin offering. There's five different kind of offerings. I want to narrow in on the sin offering today um, and just kind of give you a little bit about uh, what those, those penalties are. Or what the what the sh the the, uh, the payment then for sin is? God set up this system that when you broke the law, then there was like a payment that you could pay 
That would be the blood, remember from the video, that then, that then would cover that sin. Um, young, uh, for uh, a young bull, for the high priest and the whole congregation, the blood was to be sprinkled on the, uh, the front of the veil and put on the horns of the altar of incense. Mandatory atonement for specific unintentional sin, confession of sin, forgiveness of sin, cleansing from atonement. A male goat for leaders, female goat or lamb for common per people, dove or pigeon for poor, and a tenth of an ephah, <laughs> a fine flower for the very, for the very poor, um, is what we needed to cover sin. Um, was the was the payment that was necessary and uh, uh, one of the things I kind of like wrestled with is like why do we have to kill bulls when we do something wrong <laughs> as I was like reading through this and asking this like why do, why does like a bull have to die just because I'm an idiot and Jesus was th- through the law he was sh- the, the God was showing us that every sin has a cost Every sin has a penalty. Every sin, in order for this like thing to become like righteous and just, has to become right. I think about a time um, I was out on the campus at UWM, and I was uh, um, I was uh, kind of sharing my faith with a young Muslim man, um, and I just uh, I just asked him, you know, like, how do, why do you believe that like that that Allah is able to forgive you? And he said, well, um, well, Allah is very kind and very, um, very, like, loving. So um, he looks at me and he forgives me. And I said, well, does he do the same for me? Um, and he said, well, if you're a follower of Allah and you ask for his forgiveness, um, he, will, he will forgive you. And I thought, I thought about that a lot, and, and even since then. And uh, I thought about... A little arbitrary. A little like you can just decide when justice needs to be paid and when justice doesn't need to be paid. It doesn't make, like, like, there's no perfect justice there. Like, we understand justice. Like, if you go out and you do 100 down the highway past a trooper, you're going to lose your license. You should lose your license. I don't know what actually happens. I've never done that. <laughs> you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And drive a car. If you go out and you decide to like kill someone, there's like a penalty for that. We understand this. And we're all like, yes, there should be a penalty for that. Like what that penalty is kind of goes like depends on who you are. <laughs> God has a very good standard. Um wrongs have penalties we even talk about it we say you have like a debt to society you do this wrong thing you go sell drugs whatever and then you have like a debt to society that you have to pay and then after you paid that debt which is like some fine community service probation uh, maybe some jail time uh and you you pay that debt to society then you're like clear um and so we, like, understand that justice, like, needs to be meted out, right? We get that. And so all of us now standing, like, guilty before God. Um, there's some things that felons can't do in the United States. You can't carry a, you can't possess a firearm ever if you're a felon. So if you committed a felony, no matter how much you paid it off, you are still a felon. Um, sexual predators, you're labeled that forever. No matter, no matter what, if you get out, you do your whatever, it should be 10,000 years in jail, you do that, you get out, you're still, you're still that. And that's what the law was able to do for us. Like sinner, in the eyes of God, is worse than any of that. It's like eternally we are labeled this. No matter what we do to pay it back, you cannot. Even under the law. Open up to uh, Hebrews 10. 10.1. 10, the old system, under the law of Moses, was only a shadow. 
a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Stop there. Don't go forward. Don't go forward. (laughs) Perfect. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Do you see? Like, it was like you sin and so you covered it. You sin and then you covered it. Sin and you covered it. Sin and you covered it. It's all we had. But at the end of the day, we were still sinners. This is the, um, this is the basis for this whole series of bad blood. It's bad blood. The, bull, the blood of bulls and goats, for those under the Levitical law, was bad blood. It was the best they had, but it wasn't able to make them clean. So now there, there we have that. And they did the best they could sometimes, actually very rarely. It's not often through the Old Testament that you see this system actually, in, actually working and going forward. A lot of times they give up on it, they shut down the t- whatever. It just kind of happens a lot that this isn't um, normal for them. Bad kings or they're, un- they're oppressed or something. But they try. And we try. Because we understand justice, we, we ultimately understand moral justice. A.W. Tozer, who's one of my favorites just because I like him. I think we would have got along. Um, has, uh, talks about this idea of being morally equal. And that's our problem. Um, think of a scale, if you will, like the scales of justice. We sin, and it goes over here. Right? We offer some blood in, from like a goat, and it's able to like bring it even. But there's still sin on the scale. Right? And no sin on the scale, only way through to God. Right? No sin in his presence. Just because you're equal doesn't mean, right? We're tracking? So more sin, more blood. More sin, more blood. More sin, more blood. Like we understand that, kind of innately we understand that. That's like the, 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 sac- the uh, um, kind of our judicial system, the whole thing. It's kind of like yeah, you, you break the law, you pay for it. You break the law, you pay for it. But we understand that morally. So the majority of people, when I talk to them, when I'm out just talking to people about their faith or non-Christians that I know, um, as I ask them, like, how do you, like, you, you've done a lot of wrong things. And you say you, like, believe in a God. Like, how do you feel like you're, you're okay? Like, how are you going to make it to heaven? How are you going to be, like, in God's good graces? And they say, well, I just do the best I can. I try to be the best person I can, which is basically like saying, I know I've done a lot of wrong, but if I do enough good, I can get back to even and I can make it through. I don't want that. I don't want us to think that way. Like, like even in the church, I think a lot of, a lot of times we, we, like, we, like, really mess up. And we're like, you know what, I'll just come early to church and I'll sweep the floors. Or I'll give a little bit extra in the offering plate. And our heart's not like wicked in it, like I'm going to try to manipulate God. It's just like we feel like we need to. I was like way too, like I was way too aggressive with my family. There was like not love there. That was just like forceful. I'll, um, I'll take them all out to ice cream. Culver's, okay. (laughs) Or whatever it is. Or secret sins. We have these like lists of secret sins and we just kind of like hold on to those. But we're like, I'll just, I'll just be better at church. I'll go there more often. I'll sing louder. I'll clap louder. I'll make sure to never miss my C group. I'll make sure that I'm in my Bible every single day and it'll be good. Because then I'll like prove to God that like I didn't really mean that. That, even those things, are bad blood. I don't want us to leave here today thinking that anything we can do will ever repay the wrong that we've already done. There's no one in this room that is free from sin outside of Jesus.
Let's go to the rest of that verse, Greg. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sin year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Let's stop there. This, to me, is one of those, um, those verses Instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. Do you ever feel like that? Like, just real honestly, like, do you ever, like, feel like when, 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 you, when it's, like, time to read your Bible, all of a sudden you're just, like, boom, I'm full of all the things that I've done wrong this week. Like, I come to God, and I'm thinking, like, this is going to be really awesome, but because I'm doing it from this place of, like, sacrifice to try to earn God's thing, like, God's affection and his, his approval back, because that's where my, like, heart is at as I'm, like, coming to these things, or I'm coming to church, and I'm, like, and I'm, I'm just, like, full of all the sin and things, because, because, like, when we're, like, sacrificing in order to get from God, we become very conscious of the wrong in our life. We become very conscious of the things we're trying to pay back. That's, that's a problem. We should be approaching the throne of grace boldly, Hebrews 4 says. Boldly, confident, without like understanding, without like, because in Christ, he was that sacrifice once and for all. Would you play the next verse there, starting in uh, Hebrews 5? I'm just going to keep reading some Bible here. Hopefully this hits you the way it hit me this week. Hebrews 5 says, this is why when Christ came into the world, he said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings. Time out. Back up. But you have given me a body to offer. From the very beginning, God was not interested in animal sacrifices or sin offerings. That's what Jesus said. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. Jesus said. Go on. I have a clicker. There it goes. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. (laughs) Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scriptures. First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all time. Turn to your neighbor and say all time. Here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that when you came to Jesus, all of your sin for all time was handled and it doesn't matter if you sin anymore. That's not what that means. That means his sacrifice once was for all time. We found a better blood. Remember in the video, we need to find a a better blood. In Jesus, we found a better blood. One that erases the record of wrongs held against us. So we have sin and offering, sin, and offering, sin, and offering, sin, and offering, and we get to God, and we're like, we have all of this sin, and all of this offering, and he's like, you can't come with sin. But we come to Jesus first, and on the way in, he takes all of the offering, and he takes all of the sin, and then we come to the Father, completely clean. Completely clean. The X in the video on Josh's shirt represents sin, that it marked him, as it marked all of us. But it doesn't anymore. Not even a little. Not in Christ. So I want two things to happen today. And I know this message for many of you that are Christians is fairly basic. You're like, I get it. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin. I'm like, do you really, though? Can we get back to the very, very basics, the things that are so important? That I think the longer we're in Christ, the easier it gets to stop believing the truth of the gospel. For those of us that have come to Jesus, that in the face of Jesus, we found this refuge of complete cleansing, complete uh, 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 understanding complete like God knew us completely inside and out. There was no spot or wrinkle. We come to Jesus, and this is incredible. God, I am clean. 
But the lie for me over the years continues to be, you shouldn't be stepping in it anymore, man. Get it figured out. And I begin to take on my own, I try to begin to pay for the things that I've done. I'm like, you know what? And it's all in this guise of like really, really good. Like I'm trying to be so good for God. Like I want to do better for you, Jesus. So uh, because I did that, I'm going to turn it up. I'm going I'm to go after it harder. But that going after it harder only proves more difficult because it's in, like, it's in response to this, this sin thing that I'm like trying to push past. It'll never work. Because this is the only thing that can get rid of the, the stains that we carry is the blood of Jesus once in our lives. And as we repent of our sin and we turn from it, we ask him to cleanse us always for the rest of our lives. so much power there. I want to live a Christian life that's full of, free of guilt, that's free of shame, that's free of condemnation, that I can approach the throne of God boldly, not worried about my performance, but worrying about his, his uh, sacrifice on the cross. Knowing that for me, for all time now, I have been completely clean. And the cleansing is available all the time. Imagine a life lived in response to that, as opposed to in response to sin. Your Christian life can have one of two motives. I guess it can have a couple. Two, for today, we're going to talk about two. It may be true that that's all there is, but I, don't, I haven't thought about it enough. One of two motives. We can either live in response to our sin, or we can live in response to Jesus' response for our sin. We can live in response to our sin, or we can live in response to his sacrifice. And it's going to change everything about the way your heart lives in Jesus. It'll change everything about the way your heart lives in Jesus. Because when we, were, we start, and we're in this place, and we're like, I want to start living from in response to sin. All it's going to be is just constant understanding of your sin. Constantly it'll be, it'll be before you. Constantly your failure will be before you. But we live in response to Christ. And we live in response to his sacrifice. We're going to live a lot like Jesus. So much easier. We become free to live in Christ. There's nothing we need to add. There's nothing we need to add. Now, this is the problem that the Galatian church had. Paul said something pretty extreme to them. Uh, he said, you foolish Galatians, why are you trying to perfect in your flesh what Christ has started in your spirit? That's, the, that's the, the, the big thing here. We all like understand. We come to Jesus. But then we're like, and now I'm going to prove that your investment was worth it. Like, you don't have to prove anything to him. Right? Like, he's not sitting up there, like, wondering what he's got with you. You know, with football season starting, you can come up. Uh, football season starting, we've got a bunch of rookies on the squad. And every year we do. Um, uh, college football starts, you're like, I wonder what the team, I wonder who we've got. With the Packers here, we sang James, James Jones. I'm like, I wonder what we've got with him. God's just not that confused. Like, is he going to be a good player? Is he going to be a bad player? Is he going to, like, give his all? Is he going to what? God knows you really, really well. He thinks about you constantly, actually. He's, like, numbered the hairs on your head. It says his thoughts towards you are more than the sand on the shore, seashore, everywhere. All the sand, God thinks about you more than that. That's so much sand. That's so much thinking about you, right? 
He's not confused about what he's got in you. He's not like confused about what he paid for. It wasn't some sort of like blind auction, some like white elephant auction. He's like, I'll give my blood for whatever I get. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Like, he looked at you, counted relationship with you, bringing you back to your, your original intended purpose with him, back in relationship. He saw that and he was like, I will do anything, including God himself, putting on flesh and being the price that your sin incurred more than enough to pay for the sin you've committed. And should you stumble again, more than enough to pay for that as well. This is the message of the cross. This is clear. And as we talk about bad blood, we're going to talk about different aspects of of this over the next couple weeks. I want you to get this. That all of your good works, according to Paul, add up to, well, well, menstrual rights. Same value into cleaning you up. But in Christ, we stand completely clean. See, this idea of, 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 be, of being made righteous in Christ, not through what we've done, not through, through our ability to live better, to, to, like, to like suck it up and to work harder and decide this time I'm not going to sin, only to fail again. Like That whole cycle has been done away with. That old system of you have to pay for what you've done has been done away with. Jesus said he destroyed it. Uh, uh, we just read it. That in, in Christ, he put up a new system. And it says, come to me, and I will make you clean. Come to me, and I will make you clean, forever clean. Think about that. Would you stand with me? And let's just imagine, man, life without guilt, life without shame, Life without condemnation. A Christianity that isn't fueled by regret. A Christianity, a life with Jesus, a a relationship with God that is fueled by his sacrifice for us. God, that's what we want. So God, we're sorry in all the places that we've said your sacrifice wasn't enough by trying to do it ourselves. And we say, God, even to get today again, come clean me. We're done with the bad blood. And we receive your perfect sacrifice over our lives to clean everything completely. The Bible says that, the, the, that your sin has been removed from you as far as the east is from the west, infinitely far, that though your sins were red as scarlet, he's made them white as snow, completely white, clean, no shade of red. Lord, we're so thankful that you would do that for us. Thank you, Jesus.